this is a very readable brief paper. It's uh, it's not written in scientific jargon. It's not holding back on what it's saying. I mean, basically, it's showing that these scientists, along with many, many other scientists around the planet, are getting extremely concerned about the rapidity of climate change, where it's heading, and the lack of any action by governments to even cut back on uh, greenhouse gas emissions or reduce, you know, reduce overall emissions. Well, hello and welcome to the Climate Emergency Forum. I'm your host, Charles, and today we're diving into a crucial scientific paper that demands our immediate attention. Our title today is State of the Climate 2024, Earth in Crisis. And this is about the paper 2024 State of the Climate Report, Perilous Times on Planet Earth. And this has just been published in Bioscience, and its findings are both alarming and urgent. Of course, we'll put a link in the description for you to access it. This report, authored by a team of renowned climate scientists, including William Ripple and Christopher Wolfe, serves as a stark wake-up call. It's not just another academic paper. It's a desperate plea from the scientific community to humanity. In essence, this paper can be seen as a continuation and evolution of the scientist's warning approach, applied specifically to the current state of the climate crisis. It maintains the core elements of urgency, comprehensive analysis, and call for action that characterize the scientist's warning papers we've covered in previous videos. The message is clear. We are on the brink of an irreversible climate disaster. The report highlights that despite decades of warnings, we're still moving in the wrong direction. Fossil fuel emissions have reached an all-time high, and we've just experienced the three hottest days ever recorded in July of 2024. What sets this report apart is its comprehensive analysis of 35 planetary vital signs. These indicators paint a grim picture of our planet's health. From record-breaking sea surface temperatures to unprecedented ice loss in Antarctica and Greenland, the evidence is overwhelming. But this report isn't just about numbers and graphs. It's about the real world impacts we're already seeing devastating wildfires, deadly heat waves, and catastrophic floods are becoming more frequent and intense. These aren't distant threats. They're happening now, affecting millions of people worldwide. The authors don't mince words. They state that we're amid an abrupt climate upheaval, a situation never before encountered in human history. We've pushed our planet into climatic conditions not ever seen before our species evolved. However, this report isn't just a doom and gloom narrative. It's a call to action. The scientists emphasize that every tenth of a degree of warming we can prevent is crucial. They outline necessary steps from rapidly phasing down fossil fuel use to reforming our food production systems and adopting a more sustainable economic framework. In the next few minutes, we'll delve deeper into the report's key findings, examining some of the most critical planetary vital signs and discuss what these mean for our future. We'll also explore the solutions proposed by the scientists and what each of us can do to make a difference. The climate emergency is here and the time for action is now. Let's begin our exploration of this pivotal report and what it means for our planet and our future. Peter, 
I'm anxious to hear what you've gleaned from this latest report. Uh, thank you, Charles, and uh, uh, thank you for that excellent introduction. You you really captured the uh, very special importance of this paper and, in fact, this project. And I'm going to run through the history of this project, and I'm sure people will get some surprises. So Bill Ripple, William Ripple, he's a distinguished professor of ecology at the um, uh, University of Oregon, and I stress ecology because this whole project, which is actually a major project, includes ecology, which is not included. You really don't find ecology in the otherwise thorough uh, IPCC assessments. So I'm just going to mention the recent one, and Paul will describe the science of the recent one. It's a State of the Climate Report. It's published by Oxford Academic Journal. It mentions that we live in perilous times on planet Earth. We're on the brink of an irreversible climate disaster, irreversible social collapse is what we're looking at. It requires immediate action. Those are things that you rarely find in the other scientific papers, but this is different because uh, this is from an ecological perspective more than anything else. So uh, in 1992, there was a world scientist warning to humanity, which I remember very well, that times about 1,700 world leading scientists got together, including the majority of the Nobel laureates of the scientists. And they explained the situation at that time and where they saw and explained where we were headed, which was a very, very bad place if we continued doing business as usual, as they called it at that time. He did the... Uh, uh, the World Scientist Warning describes the number of global environmental degradations. And that was how we were looking at the world situation at that time. A large number of ongoing increasing global environmental degradations. But it's interesting that the report, it was a short report, said, what must we do? And it pointed out that there were five inextricably linked areas that must be addressed simultaneously. In other words, this is the opposite approach to the standard science of reductionism. But here's really, really important, and it's amazing to reread this. We must bring environmentally damaging activities under control to restore and protect the integrity of the Earth systems we depend on. So that's exactly what we have to do now still, and we haven't done. But what about this? We must, for example, move away from fossil fuels to a more benign, inexhaustible energy sources to cut greenhouse gas emissions and the pollution of our air and water, which comes from burning fossil fuels. We must halt deforestation we must halt the injury to and the loss of agricultural land and goes on to animal species and the oceans. So isn't that something that the scientists got together way back then and said, look, here's what the world has to do. I also want to uh, mention that uh, in this warning, they had war, which of course is, uh, I sort of try and remind myself and people of often because we're not going to get anywhere all the time. We're killing each other in these vast numbers. But they do have war, which is very unusual and special. Success in this global endeavor will require a great reduction in violence and war, a new attitude towards discharging our responsibility for caring ourselves and the earth. So that's the really quite amazing, in a sense, world scientists warning to humanity and humanity, of course, tragically didn't pick up on that, apparently. Although we did have in the same year the uh, big Earth Summit and the 1992 uh, Convention on Climate Change. So uh, the first paper that Bill Ripple and uh, some colleagues published was in 2017. Uh, in November, they published what they called a second notice of the World Scientist Warning to Humanity. So that's what started what has become a major, major endeavor and scientific project. They put together um, 15 and a half thousand scientific uh, signatories to this paper. 
almost as much as the original one from 184 countries. Now, that's really important, of course, because we have a global look at this. What I noticed that they did was that in this paper and in subsequent ones, they updated the trends, what we call indicators now, and they include multiple indicators. And I want to point out that these are very re readable papers. Um, in many ways, they're, uh, they're better to go to than the IPCC assessments. So um, this paper said, with the exception of stabilizing a stratospheric ozone layer, and it's not totally stabilized, humanity has failed to make sufficient progress in generally solving these foreseen environmental challenges. And alarmingly, most of them are getting far worse. So with the paper, or soon after the paper was published, there was a lot of interest from a lot of scientists around the world. Ripple and his team set up Alliance of World Scientists, and they have 27,000 subscribing members. I think that that's probably an old number. I'm sure it's more now from 180 countries. But what they did here was that they invited other scientific experts to write other aspects, focused aspects on the world warning from science. And um, these are fully referenced papers. Many of them are published. Um, some of them are just on the site of the Alliance of World Scientists. There's, there's over 40 of these research papers. So you're beginning to see that this is a very, very big scientific project. And it was called World Scientists Warning to Humanity, a second notice. Thank you, Peter. I got lots more, but that's okay. Thank you for that contextual uh, perspective on uh, the work of William Ripple and from 2017 and also the original warning in 1992. So it's really fascinating. And now I'd like to turn to Paul. Paul, what have you gleaned from this report? Yes, uh, thank you. The uh, As Peter said, uh, Charles, this is a very readable brief paper. It's uh, it's not written in scientific jargon. It's not holding back on what it's saying. I mean, basically, it's showing that these scientists, along with many, many other scientists around the planet, are getting extremely concerned about the rapidity of climate change, where it's heading, and the lack of any action by governments to even cut back on uh, greenhouse gas emissions or reduce... Uh, you know, reduce overall emissions. So the paper is, yeah, it's a lot easier to read than any of the IPCC documents. And Peter's given a good history and sort of background of it. You know, the Rio Earth Summit, many people um, think of that as being sort of a turning point, hopefully for the world. And it turns out that, you know, emissions have still increased at an accelerating rate since then. You know, the COP process, the climate conference on parties by the uh, UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the UNFCC uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. You know, they started the, the, the first COP, I guess, was in 1995 in Bonn at the UN headquarters, you know, just three years after the Rio Earth Summit. And, you know, we know all of these things have failed to reduce emissions, uh, which are, you know, may, maybe they're not increasing as fast as they would have without these things, but they're still increasing at ever accelerating rates. And I'll just put the, some of the things in this paper in context, because, you know, this paper was just released just uh, last week. And since then, there's been some very significant papers that support, you know, the idea of a planet in peril. So the British Zoological Society and the WWF, not the wrestling, but the World Wildlife uh, fun people did a report, joint report on what they call the Planet Living Index, and we've had a 73% drop in wildlife between 1970 and 2020. We're basically losing wildlife on our planet. It was even higher in in Latin America, the Caribbean. It was 95%. The drops in fresh water are huge. Terrestrial sort of in the middle and marine is the lowest, but marine, you know, ocean is even 56% drop. There's also a paper that um, talks about the carbon sink failing on land, terrestrial carbon sink failing in 2023. And if this trend continues, because of warming the surface, you can get less carbon. You can destroy the ability of the surface to absorb carbon. 
In this case, uh, our emissions will end up, more of them will be in the atmosphere, temperatures, so greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will spike and temperatures will spike if these sinks continue to be failing. We're seeing lots of increases in the price of everyday goods and, and things. Inflation's rampant. Central bankers aim for 2% inflation. About half of that appears to be from climate change, even more than that for food inflation. We're getting massive uh, disasters around the planet. Most recently, the Hurricane Helene, $200 billion plus, and Hurricane Milton, 50 to 100 billion estimates on that. Combine those two storms and that's, uh, you know, that's almost a half of the US military budget, just to put it in context. And these things will cause inflation. You know, the inflation, they're a big chunk of GDP. And uh, we have tipping points to be concerned about, which are mentioned in the State of the Climate Report. And also there, there were separate reports on tipping points. A really good one came out by Lenten et al., I think edited by Lenten um, in uh, 2023. And uh, the primary tipping points that we're concerned about are the uh, AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, ocean currents, and also the Amazon rainforest. You know, as bad as climate change is, it's still uh, it's it's happening faster and faster, but it's still following sort of linear trends, somewhat you know super linear, accelerating upwards. But it's it's not just showing breakpoints, and these tipping points are essentially breakpoints in the climate. So even without the tipping points occurring, you know, these sustainable development goals are seventeen of them. We're supposed to meet certain objectives by 2030, and most of them are just not going to happen. We're not on track to meet most of these sustainable development goals. The uh, next week, the conference on biodiversity starts up. Um, it, they call it COP16. We attended COP15 in Montreal in 2022, and their goals were set to preserve, set aside 30% of the surface of the earth for protected areas that's oceans and land right now we're running at about seven percent i think for land and about 18 percent for oceans countries are supposed to submit their goals to achieve 30 percent by 2030 and the vast numbers of countries have submitted nothing yet and the conference starts next week and then of course uh, in about three four weeks the cop 29 starts in baku um, and we know about the Paris uh, COP, where goals of 1.5 Celsius and 2 Celsius were set, and we're already exceeding um, the 1.5. We had a whole year of 1.6. So, so we're not we're heading in the complete opposite direction to where we need to be in in our climate system at the moment. And as this paper clearly points out, thank you so much, Paul, for all that information and your comment about the inflation is quite timely. I guess people complain about the inflation, not necessarily linking it to the climate crisis. So that's a really good uh, way to bring those two things together. So I thank you for that. And I'll just bring up a few points here that I glean from the paper. The paper mentions Arctic rivers turning orange. The paper mentions a new threat of Arctic rivers turning orange due to toxic metals coinciding with permafrost thaw. The paper also mentions record-breaking emissions, annual energy-related emissions exceeding 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent for the first time on record. And of course, you mentioned, Paul, also Hurricane Helene's impact. And the paper cites Hurricane Helene causing over 200 deaths, which we know that's an undercount and is over that now. And we covered that in our last video that that will end up being much, much more than that. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to Peter to continue filling us in on the history of these papers. Yeah, thank you, Charles. And and I, I completely agree. What Paul said was really, really important. The economics is um, a very, very big deal now. And environmentalists, um, I can understand, they tend not to go there, but it's pretty critical right now. So in 2019, Ripple and his team published a paper called 
world scientists warning of a climate emergency. And I'm just going to use what they say to begin with, just a couple of words that explains why Ripple's ecological approach and team is able to do things that the IPCC does not do. And interestingly, he had Johan Rockstrom on his team at this time. And he's a pretty heavy heater with regards to his planetary boundaries and uh, climate change. So the quote is, scientists have a moral obligation to clearly warn humanity of any catastrophic threat and to tell it as it is. Uh, this is a language and description that you will not find in the IPCC because they're under their intergovernmental panel on climate change, they're under government constraints, and they do not use terms that are called value judgments. So um, they don't say how dangerous it is even, they don't use that term, and they don't tell it as it is, so it is really, really great that Bill Ripple has brought has built up a very big team now of helping us, helping the world really understand where we're at, and also giving recommendations because the IPCC gives choices of things that we could do, but it doesn't make recommendations. These papers do. Again, they included updated trends, multiple, multiple updated trends, a large number at that time. So if things had uh, progressed so badly in the wrong direction that in 2022, they published another one with even more of the leading, leading scientists of the world. And um, uh, so there's a second warning of a climate emergency. They said at that time we're at a code red on planet Earth, the same term that the WMO used in its state of the climate published in March of this year. They also included in this paper and subsequent papers, something which they put into um, an entire paper, which was uh, feedback loops. So in the 2022 planet emergency, um, they explained the very many feedback loops that global warming will cause. So that brings me to 2023, last year, state of the climate report. So they're doing state of the climate reports now every year. And there they said something, again, which the IPCC couldn't say, which is that planet Earth is under siege. Actually, that's nothing new. There have been academics writing about that in those terms for actually many years, that the planet Earth is in peril. In the 2000, uh, this brings me to the 2024, which Paul is going to talk about. But when we got to 2000, there's major, major world climate experts on this particular one. And clearly, I think there's going to be even more climate experts joining the um, Bill Ripple project on really explaining the terrible situation that we're in and what we have to do about it. And yes, he does say in this paper that action has to be immediate. It's beyond urgent, folks, right? We've been on urgent for many, many years, so we're on immediate now. So, yeah, that brings me up to the uh, current paper. Thank you so much, Peter. And I, of course, I couldn't agree more. We've been on urgent for many years, and and yet we continue on in our current path. And so, Paul, I'd like to turn it back to you to add uh, some more information to the, all of this. Yeah, so State of the Climate 2024, very readable paper on how our planet's in peril. I love all the graphs showing, you know, the trends. It's very easy to see what's happening, you know, and even putting that in context with the wildlife report of a 73% drop and the lack of carbon sink terrestrial, you know, in 2023. All these things are just pointing one direction, and that is that we are in a a very urgent, dire situation. But I mean, how will we know if governments are taking this seriously? Because governments are saying that we're in a climate emergency. Many of them have declared it, but their actions do the exact opposite. So to give you an example, you know, one unnamed um, prime minister of some unnamed country said, we're in a climate emergency. And then a few weeks later committed billions of dollars to buying a pipeline and putting a new pipeline across the country. So this is like a farce. This is like 
like ridiculous. So how will we know when we're in an emergency, when governments actually walk the talk and treat this as an emergency? Well, look at other emergencies. Look at World War I, World War II, COVID. How did governments respond? Okay, so a number of different things that they did is, first of all, they opened the taps on money, right? During the COVID emergency, they sent the public billions of dollars to so that they could you know get groceries and do things while staying at home you know they responded very very quickly with money and and so if they actually treat this as an emergency they'll pump billions of dollars into renewables and they'll completely cut off uh funding to fossil fuel companies they'll have all kinds of policies enacted and they won't be uh, voluntary. There'll be mandatory policies. You know, we had food rationing in World War One, World War Two, right? We car manufacturers couldn't make cars in World War Two in North America. They had to make jeeps and tanks to fight the emergency. So policy will be in your face and noticeable, and they'll treat it like an emergency. They'll create all kinds of new government departments to monitor the policies and how they're working, and they'll have all kinds of metrics published on you know, what's happening, you know, World War II, they let people know, well, keep doing what you're doing, we're going to win this thing, right? So they created all kinds of uh, national inspiration and propaganda, and this involved the media. So they got the media on board, right? You couldn't have the media saying we need balance and talking to climate deniers and all that garbage and nonsense going on. And uh, they use the media as a vehicle to get the public on board and explain exactly why we need to do this. So we have uh, mainstream media outlets around the world talking nonstop about 73% declines of wildlife, about losing the carbon sink, and about how it's a perilous time for us and not talking about uh, Haitians eating dogs, you know, and all this nonsense and fake stuff that's going on. So we'll clearly know when they're treating this as an emergency and they're nowhere close to it yet. And the fact that they call it a climate emergency and do nothing about it, they're taking huge hits to credibility. So people, you know, then they wonder why aren't people trusting governments on either, you know, the right political spectrum or the left. And it's just craziness. So we'll, we'll know. And, you know, Greta Thunberg wrote a great book, the climate book interviewed a hundred different people. One whole chapter is on, the very things I'm talking about, we will know when governments are acting as if it's a climate emergency and they're nowhere close to that at the moment and they need to be. Thank you so much, Paul, for sharing all these insights, especially the the insight from Greta's book, which, uh, you know, should be something we all aspire to read and, and uh, look at. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you also, Peter, for sharing about the history of the scientist's warning and its evolution over uh, a period of time. So now I would like to also thank our audience for tuning in to us today and, and uh, taking in our, our message. And um, if you uh, learn something from this video, please consider liking the video. And if you haven't done so already, subscribing. And so we look forward to seeing you again on the next Climate Emergency Forum.